Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord in Christ Lutheran Church. It's always good to fellowship with you guys and share God's word. And I do pray that he'll bless us this day. We did have an unusual start. Um, Ann Ferreira, she slipped. She was going to be our reader today. She was very concerned here on the floor about uh, going to read that gospel passage, but we have several that uh, are willing to fill in. But let me lift her up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now, and we thank you for this chance on the Lord's Day to gather together once again. Uh, we lift up thy servant, Miss Ann, Lord. We thank you for her testimony of faith, her willing to serve in so many ways, Lord. Now look upon her with eyes of mercy. Bless the hands of those that administer health care. Do her good. Heal her and bring her back to us soon. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, she did draw a little bit of blood. It, it's one of those things where uh, I think that didn't feel good. But it uh, seemed like she's going to be all right. Um, just want to make a start, as a, our custom, with some of the announcements. Um, we have the super, S-O-U-P-E-R, bowl of caring donations. 40 bags of food plus uh, $214 in donations that will go to St. Teresa's Food Pantry. So, trying to outseed expectations uh, from years past. We're off to a good start. The Lent Food Drive inserts there it begins on Ash Wednesday, which is March 2nd, coming up soon. Last week, we had Pastor Berger here. He traditionally comes and speaks for food for the poor. So he continues to thank everyone, especially this congregation, for their generosity. Um, we have sign-ups for Ash Wednesday worship and on the 2nd. And then the Lent Soup begins Sunday the 6th. So there is a sign-up. They need to know approximately how many people are coming. We're going to remind you of this. Also, there's a concert, a free concert, over at Fairway Christian Church in the Villages. And the offering will go to Love, Inc., a uh, ministry we're, we're familiar with. And last but not least, Appreciation Sunday. We appreciate the congregation. And Joan Knight heads up that committee. And uh, if you have any questions... Ask her, okay? <laughs> Get off the easy way? Well, I, I am the substitute. <laughs> well, let's take a moment and still our hearts and prepare to worship.
the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Blessed Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God our Father and of one another. We'll take a moment for reflection. Most merciful God our Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in your beloved creation and people. At times we turn our faces away from your glory when it does not appear as we expect. At times we reject your holy word when it makes us confront ourselves. At times we fail to show hospitality to your people that you call us to welcome. Accept our repentance for our sins that we have done and for our sins due to the things we have not done. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, have mercy on us, forgive us and lead us, that we remain in the salvation of your Son, born among us, and only reflect your love in him for all your creation and people. Amen. Rejoice in the gospel good news. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, our sins are forgiven. In Jesus, we are descendants of the Most High God, our Father, adopted into the body of His Son, Jesus, and inheritors of His salvation. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we continue to live as free and forgiven children of God, our Father. Amen. Amen. Let's pray the prayer of the day. Most Holy God, our Father, Your earth is filled with Your glory. And before you, your angels and saints stand in awe. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, continue to enlarge our vision to see and experience your power at work for your people in your world. And by your call, continue to make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Prayer for the world. Let us pray. Let us pray for all victims of any forms of violence, terror, human trafficking, and all displaced peoples, all victims of ethnic, racial, gender, sexual, political, and religious discrimination and violence, all victims of natural disasters or human-made disasters, all victims of war or warlike activity, conflict, oppression, strife, including in Afghanistan, Syria, and Yemen. Gracious God, our Father of healing and wholeness, through the power of the Holy Spirit, bring relief in every way you see fit, for those impacted by natural disasters, human-made disasters, conflicts, persecution, and wars. Empower all peoples to reach out to those impacted through the power, power of Jesus Christ. God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we admit our human frailties and recognize we live in a fallen creation. Restore us in each and every way you see fit so that your will is done. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. The scripture on him. Number 574. Here I am, Lord. Stand as you are. Or no, stay seated. We'll lift our voices instead.
Amen. Let's stand as we are able for the gospel reading by Jillian today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Jesus, this is at short notice, so forgive me if I'm a bit hesitant. Jesus continues to preach to his apostles and a crowd of his disciples. Jesus commands his followers to shower radical love, blessing, forgiveness, generosity, and truth and trust, even on enemies and outsiders. Living in harmony with God, his Father's intent, brings overflowing blessing. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Be to you, Lord. Jesus said, but I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you, lend the, if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your return will be great and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not, do, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it would all be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jillian. I don't know if I introduced myself before. I know most of you know me, but uh, uh, Chaplain Chris Salerno filling in for Pastor Dave. He's on vacation and um, may be blessed in his time away and restored when he comes back. I also wanted to thank the Nurture Committee. I put this on, I felt like I sold them a little short in the announcements, but they gave me a little dove today, like a Holy Spirit dove. So I I do have that on, and um, I think they should be called uh, the Barnabas Ministry, Sons and Daughters of Encouragement. So this passage, it's, it's not one we should be surprised with. We hear it in other places, the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, Romans, it said... The ethics of the kingdom, it's sometimes called. I was just thinking when uh, Jillian was reading where they, they say, um, the Lord says, uh, judge not lest ye be judged. Not only do we know that, but the world knows that. That is probably the one verse that they all know, and they know it in the King James. I remember once I was doing a project in college, and I went across from, I uh, went to a Christian university out in California, and I went across the street to Cal State Fullerton, and I was doing a survey, it was for a project, and just asking general ethical principles, anything from uh, speeding in a car to, to what have you. And I remember somebody came up to me and says, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, I think here we know that it's not that we can't look at the fruit of somebody, because the Lord does say elsewhere, um, you, you see their fruit, but it's more the intent of the heart. We have no way of knowing Well, let's let this passage challenge us, including the speaker, because if it were me that they were talking about, it wouldn't be to forgive those who do unto you. In my natural, I would be, let's teach him a lesson. (laughs) Now, I don't usually do it, but the Lord knows the thoughts of our hearts, right? Well, let me just say a, a quick prayer. Well, dear Lord, we come unto thee, Lord, and 
I ask that you would be with us today. Feed us with the word. Help us with your Holy Spirit to have a living faith, not just a faith in our heads. Bless the speaker this day. In my weakness, be strong in, my, in your strength. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. Amen. I said this, uh, just love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. It is, like was said in the commentary, Jesus' radical love. He, his kingdom turns our natural flesh in the world the ways of the world, upside down. That's not the normal way to react. Or, you know, some of us are pretty good at forgiveness, except that one thing, that one person. Uh, no way, they don't deserve, that was, that was unforgivable. Maybe we all have one of those that we could think of. I may have said this before, when I was young, I, it's kind of a funny phrase that I always stuck in my head. Somebody... Um, smashed our mailboxes. We had three mailboxes on one post. And we knew it was the certain neighborhood kids that liked to do vandalism. And uh, I remember we were looking at it, and my neighbor, Sal, he said to me, don't worry, Chris. And he, he was a state cop, too. He said, don't worry, Chris. Remember, we're Italian-American. We believe in two things, spaghetti and revenge. <laughs> and he later told me he did, some, he did threaten them with something, and he probably may have. He could have gotten away with it. But, <laughs> you know, I think we do sometimes default to that thinking, even if, uh, you know, we don't actually do it. We catch ourselves. Paul says, take every thought captive. The economy in the ki of the kingdom. You know, I spoke on something very similar. Because I said, it's throughout the Bible, Jesus is telling this. And they're in the Greek in the imperative sense. In other words, it's commands. He's not saying suggestions. Like we, <laughs> we like to take them. You know, I, 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 th I used up a lot of my examples for forgiveness. I remember it was the, uh, the Sunday when there was uh, a reporter taking pictures outside when we were doing the service out there still, and I'm like, oh, great, I, I get to come when the reporter's here. Why isn't the uh, regular guy, Pastor Dave, here? But I remember, you know, I used a uh, famous Lutheran minister um, and his wife, Richard and Sabina Warmbrandt. I had some other examples. They had been... Uh, imprisoned under both the Nazis and the communists, or at least he had. She had been imprisoned under the communists in Romania, and they started a tremendous ministry, uh, uh, persecuted for Christ, I think is what it's known for today. But they have tremendous stories of forgiveness and how it won over even, even people who were torturers in communist Romania. But here I am thinking, oh, I, I, I spoke on this already, but uh, then... I realized that our Lutheran forefathers who put together the lectionary were smart. You see, they included a passage that was an example, one I can think of no better, the story of Joseph and his brothers in Genesis. We didn't read it today, but it's in your insert. You know the story, right? But I'll, I'll just recap it generally. Joseph had 11 brothers, the sons of Jacob. He was the favorite. To the point where his brothers began to get jealous of him. His father, you know, gave him the coat. It's commonly known as the coat of many colors. A lot of Bible scholars would say it was more like a coat with sleeves. That, you know, for like a supervisor. Here he is, the second youngest, and he's sent to supervise so from the very beginning, they didn't like their brother, Joseph. And he, he did live an exemplary life. I have to say, in the Bible, there is no sin mentioned for him. Now, I don't claim that he was without sin, but there's only one other person in the Old Testament that no sin is written of that has a large portion of Scripture, and that, that's Daniel. But Joseph, he is a foreshadow of Christ. And we're, I'm just going to touch on a few points. And I think it's no accident, too, that the earthly father of our Lord was named Joseph as well. And we sometimes gloss over him, but he's quite a remarkable story, too. And the way he reacts when he hears his bride-to-be is already with child. 
first thing he wants to do is not shame her and just take care of it the appropriate way and not expose her. But then he, when he realizes this is bigger than what he thought, Joseph is commendable as earthly father. You know, if you're from a Catholic background, St. Joseph. But I just want to reveal a little bit here of how Joseph's life foreshadows our Lord. His father sends him to check on his brothers at work. I don't know why he wasn't out there. He was the one in the fancy coat. Maybe he didn't get his hands dirty. There's always one like that, right? You know, when I was growing up, if you had a certain color coat on, you might, as a male, <laughs> you, you would get picked on and maybe beat up, you know, if you wore pink or something. Um, but I do think here, I'm not saying it's right. <laughs> I'm just trying to... Um, but no, uh, the text indicates that it was more like he was above them. And um, he was sent to check on his brothers. And I think this mirrors a passage with our Lord where there's a parable where the vineyard keeper is having his servants, they're taking advantage of the one who's overseeing them. Then he sends his son. And what do they do to the son? They kill him. Now that for Sarah is Jesus. They say it's kind of like a synopsis of Jesus' autobiography. But something similar here happens with Joseph. His brothers plot against him. They throw him in a pit. Somebody else was in the ground in the New Testament, in the grave in Gethsemane. They ripped his clothes and bloodied it. They sell him to the Gentiles, the Ishmaelites, it says. Well, in the New Testament... The Jews wanted to turn Jesus over to the Romans so they wouldn't be responsible because it said in the law, we can't, we can't execute him. But there was hypocrisy there, of course, because they didn't have a problem when the woman taken in adultery was going to be stoned. They were all ready to go. And earlier in the Gospels, too, they were ready to push Jesus off a cliff. They just weren't able to do it. So much, much like here, it happened, it came to fruition, so to speak, in the New Testament in Jesus. He was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Our Lord was too betrayed for that, huh? By his brethren, the Jewish people. The brothers lied about his disappearance. The Jewish leaders paid the Roman soldiers to lie. Evil beasts were said to have devoured Joseph. But like Jesus, he would later emerge victorious. So Joseph, the point I'm just trying to make, Joseph was the quintessential type of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. He was obedient. And that was another thing. You know, we think in this world, I reminded myself, they say there are two things when you make a decision about something difficult, you either fear the world or man, or you fear the Lord. So even Joseph, sometimes from a worldly way of looking at things, like, oh, was he tattling on his brothers? They weren't working well to his father? No, he just didn't care, (laughs) almost to a fault, um, what his brothers thought, because he wanted to honor his father. Later on, we would see the prophecies gave as youth would come to fruition, that they would actually bow down to him. That, made, that, that was also some of the prophecies he, he gave. The sun and the moon, his father and mother, and the 11 stars would bow down to him. They're like, what? E- even uh, his father rebuked him when he said it at first, but then he says to give pause, and he thinks about it. And even his father was, I was just thinking of this too, his father was tricked by the garment that they brought back. The bloody garment. But what had Jacob done to get the birthright? He tricked his own father with a garment with a fur on it, with Esau. I, I love to try to emulate the life of Joseph, but I probably am closer, if I'm honest, 
to Jacob. You know, used by the Lord, but there's a lot of times where I have to be forgiven. I have to get that grace. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, and this could kind of distill the whole thing. I'm going to try to really focus on this myself. We are to be like living epistles. All these things that are shared in sacred scripture, we're to put life to them. Yes, we're forgiven. And that's why, and, and I'm not up here saying if you don't do these, you're not saved. Because though he's speaking to a broad group, he's essentially specifically talking to people of faith. And we too are in that line. Maybe not Jewish descendants, but we are considered through faith sons and daughters of Abraham, daughters of Sarah. The Bible says the commonwealth of Israel, the Israel of God. So we should act likewise is what the Lord is saying. Because what better way to testify than to forgive somebody, to be charitable? Charity is the top of the graces. Sometimes they say love, but other times it's translated well as charity. Be charitable to others. I just had a couple of examples I wanted to share. And by the way, we have how much of our service is based on forgiveness. There's the absolution right in the beginning. And we're not the only church that does it. You know, the Catholic Church, the Anglican, the Reformed Church, some of them do it. It's called the keys to the kingdom, a passage from Matthew 16, 19, if you're wondering if it's in the Bible, because some people say, well, how could you forgive sin? Well, it's not me. It's a called servant of Christ doing through what he tells us to do in Scripture through him, through his work. Matthew 16, 19 talks about uh, whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven and loosed. In Isaiah in the Old Testament, 22, 22, but also in John 20, 19 through 23, I want to read it, just in case you wondered if this was <laughs> biblical. Okay, I want to make sure I have the right passage. He, he tells them, he breathes on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. This is our Lord speaking to the apostles. If you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven to them. If you will withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So basically, he's, he's giving to the disciples the keys to the kingdom, which is passed down through the church leadership, essentially, the called servants of Christ to forgive others. And there are other passages that are consistent with this. The important thing to remember is we are, we are forgiven. And the other lesson they don't mention the Apostles' Creed. They mention it, or they do mention it, but they don't mention the forgiveness part. That is in the Apostles' Creed. What else is it in? Something else we'll say today. The Our Father Prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Forgive others if you've been forgiven. So just a couple quick examples I thought I'd share. It's, it's interesting, too. I was just thinking with uh, Joseph and his brothers. They... They trembled when they found out who he was in Egypt. The second in command, and I won't, you know, it's, that story of Joseph is one quarter of Genesis. That's a lot to, for that one character. So I'm not going to recap it all, but we know at the end. He's second in command, only below the Pharaoh. And they come, and he knows who they are. They don't recognize him. It's years later, and he looks like an Egyptian. And how could it be possible that he's the second in command of Egypt? And they're coming for food because there's a famine in the land. And Joseph's part of the reason, the main reason why Egypt had planned so well, that they even have an abundance that they could sell to the neighbors. And Joseph tells them to be not afraid, come close to me. Foreshadow of our Lord. They're trembling when they realize what they deserve for what they did. But he knows, because he has such faith, that what others meant for evil, God meant for good. That's hard to wrap your head around when th you're in the middle of things. But Joseph's able to do that. And I remember I studied uh, my, as an undergrad human development. And you, it was biblical, but you also have some 
some secular counseling thrown in and social work and sibling rivalries, I could tell you. Also, from my work as a chaplain, they're the toughest ones to overcome. You know, I deal with a lot of people at end of life, and a lot, more often than not, there's always a little wrinkle with the siblings. The parents seem to be able to forget a little bit easier, but the sibling, it's, it's tougher. So, could you imagine this dynamic, to be forgiven when he could have taken their lives? I heard Rod Rosenblatt. He, Rod Rosenblatt is a Lutheran minister. He's also a professor. Uh, used to be at Concordia, California. And he told a story about a pastor who a girl came to him and she couldn't get rid of the guilt she felt. I believe it was about an abortion. And it wasn't immediately after. It was some time had passed and she was truly contrite. He absolved her of her sin and they were talking and Before she was going to leave, she said, am I really forgiven for that? And using good pastoral wisdom in the Holy Spirit, the pastor said, for what? (laughs) Emulating our Lord. That's how the Lord looks at us. We may not forget it, but he treats us as if he can't even remember it. When I worked at the VA down in Tampa for a while. I was an army chaplain for a while and then got a privilege to work at the VA. One of my uh, colleagues was talking about a man who was a seasoned veteran and he was in combat and he's, he was really, he struggled with forgiveness of himself. He's, he said, I killed people. And don't tell me like you chaplains, we're actually trained to talk about just war because that's, that's what our government says, that we don't go into war unless it's just cause and it's better to, to go in for, and, and toward evil. He didn't want to hear that. He was convinced that he had killed, murdered. So my friend could see, you know, he talked to me about it. And I, I, he's not going to receive that uh, army philosophy of a just war. So let him believe it, go with it. And he, he went and he said, uh, you're right, you know the Ten Commandments. You killed. God's forgiven you. Your sins are no more. And the man had a tremendous burden lifted. He said, I've talked to so many chaplains and none has ever just said it that way to me. And then he happened to be a Lutheran background. He took communion. And that's when I realized, and also working in an army hospital in Germany, the denominations that have a high view of the Eucharist the body and blood of Christ, they were actually able to minister better, I'm going to say, to those who struggled with guilt, PTSD, because they were able to come and partake of the body and blood of the Lord like the cross right before them. And we, we're going to have the opportunity of that today. And we're baptized too. The Lord gives us signs. Whether you're baptized as a baby or later in life. I was baptized into Christ. That's what I tell Satan when I have these thoughts in my head. Because whether it's Satan or just him giving memories of us when we were hurt when we were young maybe. That's a big one too with people coming to me. It's, they struggle with things that were said to them. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. You'll never amount to anything. You have girls that are still struggling with uh, food disorders because somebody said they were fat. They're sneaking in the bathroom to vomit after they eat. I remember one teacher at school, we were getting our pictures taken, and we were in a row, and the photographer was called in, and uh, he was getting smart with the students. Uh, I guess that was just his personality, and he, he said to the girl in the back something like, Hey, Lurch, move in. And the teacher rebuked him, like, you can't talk to the students that way. Do you? And that was good that he did that. That guy, I guess he realized it and apologized. I had one man in hospice, and he called me to his home, and he was really struggling with guilt, and he was a veteran too. I won't say his name. I don't know if he's still alive, and I won't say what the guilt was, but I'll say this. It really was unfounded. He felt guilty about the way he took care of somebody 
but, but I realized if I just said it's not your fault, that wasn't going to worry. I've never seen a man more demonstrable about his guilt. He said to me more than one time, don't you see it? Guilt written right here. Guilty. It's on my forehead. Don't you see it, chaplain? That, you know, somebody, I'd been around veterans, so I, some people would have actually been <laughs> intimidated, I think, to have been there with them. And I think it was the Holy Spirit just told me, get up and put your arms on his shoulders and said, I'll make up a name, um, Leo, Leo, your sins are forgiven. Leo, your sins are forgiven. I actually got loud with him. I've never done this before. Leo, your sins are forgiven. And he broke down crying and hugged me. And it was the Holy Spirit, because I wasn't, you have these moments in ministry where you're not sure, like, yeah, it seems like it worked, but maybe, maybe I'm just not seeing it right. I better call the next day and see if he wants me. He's like, no, no, no. I had a bereavement counselor call him, and she said, no, no, he's fine now. But he, that's what he needed, forgiveness. And let me wrap up by telling you a story about one I encounter a lot. I work in chaplaincy with a lot of people at end of life. Well, there are many people who have come to me and they've struggled with this guilt for 20 years. They need to forgive somebody. They're not going to. There's no way they're going to forgive this person because it was, it was too bad. They knew better. They did it anyway. And this guilt of doing this was actually ruining their lives. But they said, no, I can't forgive them. And that person was themselves. Who of us doesn't have guilt that needs to be forgiven? And it's, it's very easy to carry guilt around with us. But the Lord of, heaven, the Lord of glory went to the cross, died, and rose again to overcome sin and death. Praise God. So our charge today, I'm wrapping up here, is just uh, how, what better way to show God's love than forgive others, and especially unbelievers. Especially. You know, we all have the world, the flesh, and the devil working against us. Unbelievers, they don't have this book. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They really don't have hope. You know, I see it in their eyes at the end of life. They act strong until they lose their own physical strength. And by that time, they might be too stubborn to bend the heart, the knee. But I can see it in their eyes. They're scared. And we do what we can to minister. Sometimes the Lord does do a thief on the cross, 11th hour legitimate conversion. But you don't want to wait that long because your heart does get harder <laughs> the longer you wait. But that's our charge today. Let's act like forgiven people. Forgive others. Be charitable. The upside down kingdom does what people doesn't expect. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and the suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to us all. In the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread and gave thanks. And he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection and ascension, we await his coming in glory 
pour out thy Holy Spirit, that by this Holy Communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Well, let's sing the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. Thanks be to God. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen us and keep us in his graces, both now and forever. 
Amen. Let us sing the blessing and stand as you're able. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord, singing, Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Continue standing for our sending him. Amen. I like that Hebrew cadence too. Final announcement. If you have not gotten one of these white doves, you can do so here on the way out from uh, Joan here. See her. Continue to bring Christ to all people today and every day. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen.